Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food & Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, and my guest today is somebody who I've been trying to track down for a good long time now. He is the chef partner of the Henry at the Life Hotel. He is the founder of Field Trip and the newly minted James Beard Award winner for his book, From Heaven to Harlem. Welcome, J.G. Johnson. How are you? I am ridiculously happy to sit down with you because I feel like I've been trying to schedule this for 10 years, and you're a man in motion. <laughs> I'm a man in motion. I love how you call the book From Heaven to Harlem because you can call that too. Oh, is it From Harlem to but Heaven? From Harlem to Heaven, oh, but either golly. way, it can work any way because yeah. you can feel like you're in heaven <laughs> or you come to Harlem because Harlem is a very heavenly place or you can be yeah. in Harlem and then go to heaven. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. I screwed that up, but I do <laughs> like that point very much. You're, uh, it's the transcendence of all of this. It's food. however it makes you feel. Good. I mean, really when I talk about you, uh, as a man in motion, I was trying to remember the exact date of this, but I so vividly remember meeting you because you ran up to me. You were cooking at the James Beard Awards when it was still at Lincoln Center. Yes, I was. I was, uh, cooking, in our booth, it was when I was a chef de cuisine at the Cecil, mm-hmm. and I caught you out the corner of my eye. <laughs> I used to follow you. Oh, not that I used to. I still follow you on Twitter, but I was following you on Twitter from your CNN days, and I've always wanted you to write about me, and I ran yeah. up to you and said, are you Kat Kishman? <laughs> and you were like, yes, who are you? And I was like, I'm JJ Johnson, You're the J. chef J. From, from the Cecil, and... We had like a really brief conversation and you said, don't worry, I'm going to come up there and check you out. I love all the work that you're doing. Well, I remember that after that, I I, I filed you in my head because I was thinking like, there's just something about you. There really is just something about you that I knew. It was funny because I sort of thought like, this is a kid to watch, whatever, like, (laughs) I'm I'm just trying to remember how old uh, you were at the time, and it's funny. 27, I think. Yeah. Oh, gosh, we were both sort of kids. It's been a long time since I was a kid. (laughs) But you're, you're you're fresh and young, and just the energy with which you came up to me was so impressive, and I would run into you at things, and I would, it was always so hard to sort of pin you down, like, I'm cooking at the Versace mansion. (laughs) (laughs) I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And uh, you know, and you have remained in place at some some places, but you, it, it seemed like your career has been this incredible rocket ship that has happened. But I mean, to maybe somebody who's a casual observer, but I also know when I think of you, you're not just in motion. You're one of the hardest workers who I have ever oh, encountered. Thank you. thank you for that. Yeah, I mean. You know, I was at the Cecil for for five years. Mm-hmm. And Minton's. And well, Cecil and Minton's, right. Cecil started at the Cecil for the first two years and kind of took over Minton's. Yeah. Uh, and kind of ran that. I was part of that legacy there. Mm-hmm. It went in a totally different direction. I kind of left. And in the, mo- the moments of leaving, it was me to spread my wings and said, I need to go out and do food how I, I want to do it culinary approach how I look at it. Yeah, let's talk about what you were doing there because it was really special. I did get to Minton's and I was actually there with Pete Wells on a review dinner and the flavors were so specific and beautiful and like nothing I'd really ever had before. It was definitely food with a point of view, with with really a story to tell, something to say, and it was delicious as all hell. But it was it was so incredibly specific. But I gathered from things that that I read that the focus maybe had to fuzz a little. Yeah, I mean at Minton's when I took it over, so that was you know Minton's is a jazz. It was a jazz supper club at that time. The focus was to cook like food from the American South. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that I truly never cooked in a refined moment. You're a New York guy. Yeah, I'm. Pe- I, well, I'm a. I'm grew up in the Poconos. <laughs> oh right, <laughs> which I was thinking of like heart shaped hot tubs. Yes, you got it right, 100. <laughs> percent I went to high school down the street from that place. <gasps> oh my gosh, like I have the commercial <laughs> in the, my head. The beautiful, beautiful Mount Airy Lodge. It's yes, that's exactly there it. There <laughs> now, and it's a casino. <laughs> oh wow! Roll your dice however you want to roll them. Oh my golly! <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, you know, I, t- I, I took that, I took it over because I felt like it was the right thing to do. But mm-hmm. looking back, I probably would have never taken over Minton's. Mm-hmm. It was something that you 
are when you're like in this emotional state of doing well, you're like, you think you can take over the world. Yeah. And at that moment I said, oh, I can do this. I can do this food. Mm -hmm. And I started to cook food that I was very unfamiliar with. Luckily, Alexander was there. Oh, and Alexander, tell you know. the people who Alexander Smalls is. So please. yeah, Alexander Smalls is a famous opera singer uh, known for Tony Award on Porgy and Best um, and had some great restaurants in New York City, one called Cafe Bueller. And, the, and then he had the Cecil. He was the owner there with Richard Parsons. And I used to work for them. So Alexander is a Southern boy from uh, Buford, South Carolina. Oh, okay. I, I for some reason there's some reason I'm thinking Buford. I got I know people who live down in South Carolina, or something, but from Buford to New York City. Yeah, from Buford to New York City, he bounced. But yeah, he he really wanted this Southern Supper Club. So he was the orchestra of what Minton's uh, was, and I kind of fed off of him in that area. The mm -hmm. Cecil was a brainchild of both of us with Afro Asian American cooking, which you can get, you can see what we've done in between Harlem and heaven. Um, and Cecil was truly something that you never saw in the world or the country. Um, and I think it opened up a lot of doors for people to be able to feel comfortable cooking who they are. But okay. So you're cooking this food and maybe that's the first time you have this particular position, but you came from a pretty intense background of, of cooking. You had you worked at a lot of places before that. Yeah, I mean, I worked at I worked at uh, Tribeca Grill, le the legendary Tribeca Grill. I worked at Jane for a couple of years, helped open up the Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked at Chanchovina Teca under Leah Cohen um, for a little bit, little stint. And then I was at Morgan Stanley Executive Dining Room, which was a very different part of my career, but um, helped me understand, I think, of what a business, what a restaurant business, what it's like to run a restaurant business, even though it wasn't a true restaurant. That chapter of your life fascinates me so much because I know that it's a clientele that is really, they have a ton of resources. They are used to, you know, particular access to, you know, high echelon foods and all of this. So that's an incredibly demanding clientele that is in some ways built in <laughs> okay you laugh tell me there's there's something there no 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 <laughs> you're you've, you've you're right like you're talking about a place that a, a kitchen that nobody knows exists mm -hmm. things happen in the space that you would can never really imagine for from world leaders to financial meetings food is really a second an afterthought because it's oh you're eating food over business but that you are eating some of the best food products in the world like mangalisa pork or um, dry aged uh, Wagyu beef um, or you know we used to get hind quarters of beef in and you know why would you get a hind quarter of beef here but you're changing the menu literally every day um, you know at that time the CEO of Morgan Stanley was John Mack he was a big foodie he actually has a uh, a cattle farm in North Carolina so he was very into food and he wanted to see food at a certain level um, and the chef at that time was Zach Friedman, who worked at Chantrell and 11 Madison oh, Park. Oh, God, I love Chantrell. So, you know, some of those, you know, I know how to make this, the famous seafood sa sausage from sa Chantrell because oh, God. I worked under somebody from there. So That is a legendary. If people aren't familiar <laughs> with this because Chantrell has been gone for a while, I was, yeah. it was one of the very first restaurant experiences I had in New York that made me feel like a grown up, I, I I went in there way overdressed because <laughs> for me it was it was a super fancy opportunity and it was during restaurant week and of course all the rich people are there in shorts and stuff and I'm wearing like a ball <laughs> gown or something because I don't know better. That and, was like proper. Yeah. That was like proper Tribeca days. Yeah, that's and, when Tribeca was like the mecca of food in New York. Like you can you went to Tribeca to eat anything and everything. Yeah, so it's this sort of super fancy thing. So when you say that seafood sausage, thing, I just have such a like a sense memory of. <laughs> Of that kind of thing. But I, I think it's a, such an interesting thing, this hidden world of uh, food that is being done, because I feel like there are a, a few more of those places opening up now that people don't really have access to. There's going to be like a members club opening up in Hudson Yards. There are these private restaurants and these really high end, uh, you know, mile high uh, buildings. And yeah, stuff. I think the best um, executive dining room or members dining room in New York City is Bank of America on Bryant Park. So the kitchen oversees the park. It's an open kitchen that you can see from the dining room. The executives are getting a real dining experience every time. 
uh, like if they were in a if they were in a high end restaurant. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you're right, it's it's a it's a different lifestyle. I'm a member of Soho House, um, but it is a truly different lifestyle in the members club of the food that comes out or satisfying somebody for what they want to eat versus what you are cook what what you would like to cook for them. And how does this feel like you're making fancy things for people who have everything. Yeah, I mean for that for their justification, they said that at one point they used to dine out so much that people would overhear business transactions. Mm-hmm. So they needed to bring all that in-house. Okay. I think from a restaurant standpoint, right? Like a lot of those corporate dining dinners that we were that restaurants were booking, we then lost out on 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 that in the restaurant. Oh, so from an ec- ec- and from an economic standpoint, the average uh, corporate the average corporate group that goes out might only go out one to three times a week versus three to, uh, three out of the six times a week because they have the access for the food inside and it's already paid for with it's part of their expense. Um, so it, it it is very interesting and um, it's just another. I think if you're if you're for me as like a that has a, my own like hospitality group or JJ Enterprise however you want to look at it it's an area I look at to tap into like yeah. how can I tap into a corporate dining place in New York City with Bank of America or Morgan Stanley mm-hmm. or Barclays or Hearst and put my food that people then eat every day mm-hmm. and it's a budgeted account versus a a transactional account. This is the thing I love about your brain is that you you do the food, but then you have you are a a mogul. Like this is <laughs> this is within you. And I'm just thinking of you in this, you know, Morgan Stanley dining room, and you're 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 doing all this, but you're not a person who can stay behind the scenes. Like you're not built for that. And I have never sensed that from you. That like you're born to be a star. <laughs> I appreciate that. I mean, I was I think I was just born to be eager. Mm-hmm. I'm very thankful and blessed that I'm able that people will listen to what I say mm-hmm. and um I'm able to have the conversation. Uh, Has that always been part of you? That this that that eagerness. Like when you're what is teenage JJ thinking here? Are you thinking like, oh I'm gonna be a chef? I'm gonna Yeah, teenage JJ was always gonna be a chef. Mm-hmm. Um but I did run for like class president as a kid. Mm-hmm. I I was I did give speeches at graduations. Were you prom um, king? I wasn't prom king. <laughs> I wish I was prom king. <laughs> let's retroactively vote you prom king. <laughs> <laughs> let's bring. Let's go back in time. <laughs> or you know, so I was always I was always a part of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, my dad raised me as like the don't live life like you could have, should have, would have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think my dad raised me that way because he had some really great opportunities in his life that he passed up on that maybe could have changed the way that I that he raised his kids. As if he now he looks back as a 67 year old man. Um but yeah, I mean, I'm thankful to be able to employ people, have a culinary point of view, and kind of look at the food industry slightly different than my peers look at than my peers look at it. Yeah. So you so you see at Cecil and Minton's like you're not it's it's not working for you anymore because I, I know that like the the menu had to become more maybe touristy or something or Yeah, they wanted you know, they wanted to they brought in a new operating company, they wanted it to be uh, a steakhouse. Mm-hmm. Um that's not where I wanted to be. No. If I'm going to cook at a steakhouse, I might as well go to Peter Peter Luger. And not when you had won you know, Best Restaurant. Was it was it GQ, Esquire? Esquire, Esquire Best Esquire, Restaurant. Josh Josh Zersky. Zersky, yep. you know. So, you know, thank, I think Josh Zersky was, was is my angel that flies over me. He, um, for if folks aren't familiar with him, he's a food writer who passed away some years ago. And I believe his memorial uh, was... Was that at the Cecil? Or? Yeah, we did have yeah. the memorial of, yeah. for Josh at the Cecil. It was only the right thing to do. Yeah, the people who, in all the planning, thought where would he have been happiest, and and clearly he had made his you know choices known uh, for all of this. Like he was a man who was not shy about his passions. <laughs> not was, shy at all. I knew I, uh, I I knew him for a long time before he was the a food critic, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I, I I knew that when I heard that the celebration was going to be there. That it was very much the right 
thing. Oh, it's good hearing co- coming from you. Yeah. yeah. Josh was doing. Josh was great. I remember the first time he came in to dine and. He had oxtail dumplings. He like opened the oxtail dumplings with his hands. He wasn't even supposed oh. to come there to eat. A friend invited him for a drink. He was just mm-hmm. passing by, I think on his way to Mountain Bird in East Harlem at that time. And um, we had a great conversation and we built a really great rapport, uh, became friends. Um, and he would always give like, a, he would always give words of wisdom to me as he felt as I grew in the industry he wanted to make sure I didn't become a certain type of chef. Mm-hmm. And that when other chefs grew in the industry, they became a certain type of way and they forget about their peers that might not grow with them. And he would say, I don't want to see you at the top of a mountain clinking your glasses and forgetting about everybody at the bottom of the mountain mm-hmm. because the people at the bottom of the mountain have all, will always be with you through the highs and the lows. I used to say, Josh, I mean, my mom tells me that every day, so mm. I, I'm happy you're telling me this. <laughs> but it really stuck with me yeah. because it was like he really cared he really was he really cared about me as a as a chef and a person. He loved hard. He loved very hard the yes. things that he that he loved. And you you know, you you came there there comes a time when you have to spread your wings. You can get comfortable and settle in, be like, oh, this is what it is, but you're not built for that. And when you left there, is, did you go directly to Chef's Club? What what was what was the trajectory from there? So I knew Aaron Arizi because he he was the booker for Chef's Club. Mm-hmm. He used to come to Cecil a lot. Um, we knew each other in passing. I loved his pocket fork. Pocket uh, fork, yes. Yeah. Um, very amazing for Really photos. good writer. And really great writer, yes. And I think actually I met him. He was a server at... Uh, Roberta's? No, it was... Uh, David Chang Place, Midtown, not Ma Pesh. Ma Pesh. Okay, yes, yeah. he did work at Ma Pesh. He did say that. Um, but before I kind of hit up Aaron, uh, a close buddy of mine, his name is Jerron Smith. He's a former Forbes 30 on the 30 um, guy just like me. Right now he's a CMO for Steph Curry. Um, wow. And we wind up going out and hanging out. No, I wind up calling him, and he wind up being in New York. I said, Jerron, like, I need some advice. Like, you you have all these amazing jobs. Like, he was Barack Obama's brand ambassador. <laughs> no like, the slouch. jobs you never dream, like, you dream about. Right. Like, I wish I could have a job like that. Um, and he said to me, best advice he gave to me, is like, when you're down and out or you don't know what to do, you need to call a friend. Mm-hmm. A friend that's going to help you get from point A to point B. And I was like, well, who can I call? And I wind up running into Aaron at a place, and I said, "Aaron, I want to do a, I want to do a pop up at Chef's Club Counter, for my rice shop concept." And he's like, "No chef ever wants to cook at Chef's Club Counter. I'm not really sure I can sell the owner on that. Mm-hmm. But why don't you come and do a tasting, and I'll bring it up to him, and we'll see." So I go and do a tasting at Chef's Club Counter, one of my worst tastings of all time. Oh no! What happened? It just the food wasn't right. I wasn't in my element. I mentally wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, emotion is very—it's um, truly everything when you're cooking. If you're happy, then you will put out your best food. Um, but for some reason, the owner's name is Stefan. His wife comes in. She's like, "I'm really hungry." I go back in the kitchen. I make. The, these three dishes for them. She literally is devouring the food, and she goes to Stefan. Oh, we need to, we need to find, we need to put JJ. We need to find something for him. I've never tasted anything like this in my life. Oh, what did you cook? I made like uh, this coconut sticky rice. I did, um, I did this grain salad with like um, citrus and this uh, red barley. Oh, this blue barley from West Africa and like uh, mosh. Um, and then I did like a uh, salmon with peri peri sauce and a certain type of rice. Okay, let's talk about you and grains because this is really a through line when I ate at Minton's. Like there was a grain I'd never had before. And it just, I'm such a texture person that it, it just really stood out to me in a really... You know, it's funny, like, if you find an extra door in your house somehow, like, I have dreams where, (laughs) like, walking around my house and there's, like, another door. I'm like, ah, where does that go? And it's a whole other room. And when I have something that uh, interests my my brain, my palate, and all that, I I really, I stand up and I I take notice. You have a gift with grains, and you are cooking with grains that people, uh, you know, they're... 
there are ones that might not be in the canon of everyday American cooking. And you are taking steps to maybe put them there. Yeah, that's the goal. Um, I cooked at Blackberry Farm for a Southern Food Alliance dinner. In the midst of that, I was reading a book called Black Rice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I in that book, the woman talks about this pure grain, pure rice grain called, and I never pronounce it right, called Glamorema or Glamorema. And... I just happened to be coming out of the prepping and Glenn Roberts was walking by <gasps> okay. from Anson Mills. Glenn Roberts is a godsend to the world of agriculture and food. Correct. If you want to explain who So is. Glenn's like a walking encyclopedia about he knows everything about rice and grain, but not just like your everyday rice. You're thinking I know you're thinking rice, you're thinking Uncle Ben's. He's <laughs> talk he is bringing back the heirloom or with me and him call it now, like these granddaddy or grandma grains that have fueled, fueled communities in the world. Mm-hmm. So I asked him about this rice grain. He kind of faces turn red. He's saying, nobody's ever asked me about this. Um, I'm not sure it even exists anymore. Wow. But I'm going to put you in contact. Like, you know, I'm going to put you in contact with somebody. I'm like, okay, this guy's never going to email me. A week and a half later, he emails me and puts me in contact with a rice researcher based out of Cornell. Okay, I love that there are rice researchers. And she goes, I travel to West Africa once a quarter, and I think I know somebody that grows this grain. And I'm just telling you this story because, like, it leads up to, so we kind of smuggled this grain back in from Tago. It's super pure, super starchy. We hope that it's that grain. That was six, seven, seven years ago. Okay. In the course of that, Glenn has then teamed up with other people to keep researching for this grain, and they've found a trace of it in Trinidad. They found a trace of it in another part of the West Indies. They found a trace of it in Brazil, right? They believe they have the grain now, and they're starting to grow it in Mississippi. So in the process of that, everywhere that I was traveling— um, over the years, I started to look at rice really different. So when I was in Singapore, I was looking at rice different. When I was in India, I was looking at rice different. When I was in Israel, and I realized that rice was always at the center of the table. Every culture. Every culture. It didn't matter if you had a lot of money or a little bit of money. And I said, why don't we try to, why don't I try to make a rice shop like a ramen noodle shop? Oh, yes. Right? Like these ramen, like, there was there was there was ramen noodle shops, of course, before David Chang did Momofuku, but there wasn't like an impact, mm-hmm. right? Nobody was looking for it. Right. People weren't going into gentrified community and pop, putting a ramen noodle shop before Momofuku opened. Yeah, you know, now you open a, you go to a new community, you look for a ramen noodle shop and a coffee shop, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna move here. Yeah, it, it's and it's a meld of the. I mean, the food's got to be there and at right. a level, but the, it's a lot of marketing, a lot of packaging, a lot of figuring out what the dining space is, is gonna look like. There's so much more than that actual food, and there's an alchemy that happens when that all comes together, and having backers to do it really, <laughs> really helps a lot, and. You so you have this notion. I want to do this with with rice. So then your business mind kicks into play. So yeah. There. So we so from from like the geek point was like okay, what places in the world make a lot of rice, but also like fuel a community. So we pick we I, me and Glenn talked. We picked out about six or seven places, mm-hmm. and I went really deep and looked at American rice. And American rice is enriched. It's bleached. Um, it has GMOs in it. it has all this trash. Right. Yeah, or it, all the all the good stuff is actually taken off the rice. It just leached right out. Right. So for us at field trip, or in the process, like, okay, I want to do rice that's not bleached, not enriched, and has no GMOs. So like that's the foundation. Then from there, can we get these rices around the world that come from a community and tell a story? So we've been a- I've been able to do that now, and field trip will be coming ju- June first. <gasps> That's so exciting. Um, and to be in Harlem, and the goal was to go in communities that, again, rice is always at the center of the table, um, and people are looking for rice or eat rice on a daily base. And hopefully we'll talk about Field Trip as the new rice shop, as people talked about ramen noodle shops. Yeah, and let's talk about the decision of where to put these shops, too, because the thing is sometimes these chains come in, and they're big and yay and stuff like that, but they don't get 
put into uh, communities where people actually eat the food. They're they're put in gentrified communities. They're put in, like, frankly, very white areas, a lot of these places and stuff. And you're making a decision to put these shops in other places. Yeah, for uh, for two reasons is, like, yeah, would I love to open up a place inside of one Brookfield or... Uh, every airport on Earth. Or every airport <laughs> on Earth, right? Or... Um, or in Soho, yeah. But when we look at the economics from it, mm -hmm. first, I'm not paying twenty five to thirty thousand dollars a month in rent. Right. So that's not happening. There's these areas in cities that have really high density levels, and the Chipotle's and the Shake Shacks, and the Little Beats and the Chick Fil A's come to those markets on a they're their secondary market. But when they realize they go into those markets, they become one of their busiest markets. This mm -hmm. is the reason why Popeyes, McDonald's, mm -hmm. Burger King are all in these markets because they're very busy for them. Mm -hmm. Why don't I follow Popeyes and McDonald's and add something to the market that everybody's looking for? So our, our primary markets are all the secondary communities of the world. It's also a great vote of confidence in a community because if you if you can get a community and hire from the community right then it becomes self-supporting in a really yeah but if meaningful we, way or if you look at musicians right musicians come up through their community mm -hmm. they don't come up because they just were like a one-hit wonder and everybody loved them like jay-z became jay-z because brooklyn his small community mm -hmm. was behind him then brooklyn got behind him then new york got behind him mm -hmm. then it spread so if we look at it like that, that's how we're trying to build field trip. And hopefully we can put field trip in an airport because an airport yeah. connects people, but it also lets people that are coming through airports be able to get food that is slightly better than anything else oh that's in there. Oh my gosh. As a person, you travel a lot as well. <laughs> it can be pretty pretty grim. It's I mean, it's nice to go into an airport sometimes and there, you know, being a Shake Shack, being a whatever. Yeah. But, but my particular airport thing is though, I like to find whatever the regional thing is and and get it. So what's your favorite thing in the airport? Well, depends on which airport. Or is what, the what's thing. your favorite airport to fly to and, and eat at? Oh my gosh. So I, I used to spend a lot of time at the Atlanta airport okay. and there is a place, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on it. Um, it is fly by one, one by fly. I uh, know. I mean, that is really, really great. There is a soul food place in the Atlanta airport that has some really great sweet potatoes. I'm totally blanking on what recently is recently or old, like. Uh, it's been there for ages and ages, and there's only one other like brick and mortar shop of it, like in Atlanta. I don't know that. I don't. I don't uh, it'll Atlanta it'll it'll come to me, but it's it's really. So the next time I go through Atlanta, I'm looking for these sweet potatoes. The, the greens are ridiculously good. Like they'd be good kind of anywhere, but especially in the airport, like. And I've just ended up getting laid over there so many times. <laughs> um, in Memphis, there are a couple of barbecue places yes. that I like to mm -hmm. go to. And the thing is, like, I always end up getting the barbecue spaghetti, even though I don't like barbecue I've never spaghetti. Had barbecue spaghetti. Before. It's a it's a thing, and I feel like it's sort of a when in Rome kind of thing. <laughs> in Denver, I remember having uh, testicles at an airport, but it's sort of like the what is the thing that I what is the regional thing that I can get if I I'm from near Cincinnati, so I always get the chili and. There, you know, it's, you know. I like that. I'm going to start looking at airport food differently. Yeah, I know, because it seems like such a chore, and some often it's just like the horrible chicken sandwich. I just want to get in and get out, and the only time I truly yeah. spend my time in the airport is if my flight's delayed. Yeah. Oh, I will say there is a Frontera grill that is Oh, yes, in. <laughs> yes. We all, but that's, if you go but, through Chicago, yeah, you have then to. you wind up stopping there in or on your way yeah, out. Yeah, and you're going to get stuck there anyway, yes. so you, you might as well. <laughs> it's driving me crazy that I will remember the name of the place in Hartsfield, Hartsfield Jackson, but I've been happy to be laid over there. Really good fried okra there, too. Ooh. Yeah, the airport. I know. Who knew? I make really good fried okra. So. This I have an okra tattoo on this arm. Okay. Yeah, and it's heirloom okra, so it's red. That's great. <laughs> yeah, because I I grow it. So if people only like if you tell somebody that they should be looking for red okra if they don't know it, they look at you with like eight different eyes. Like, what are you talking about? Actually, Guy Fieri saw this and he's like, "Oh, that's really pretty." Like, did you just make it up? I'm like, "No, no, it's it's, it's an heirloom one. It's actually from my my garden. I'll send you seeds. I sent him seeds and he grew them. That's great. He sends a nice thank you note. Guy, <laughs> Guy Fieri does." <laughs> um, but so we've gone to a different place with this. But I love the notion of you becoming like the the Shake Shack of grains. I hope. I mean, if I could become Shake Shack of grains or rice, <laughs> Shake Shack of rice, or then, any of these um, things. God bless me. I did something right. I mean, for uh, for 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 us. Uh, when I say us, like everybody. Yeah, that who's works, us? <laughs> everybody that works with the JJ and on field trip. 
the goal internally is if we can get to 10 units, mm -hmm. um, then we hit a home run. Yeah. And I mean, that'd be one in Queens, one in the Bronx, one in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and then potentially like in Oakland or downtown LA or, um, or North Carolina or Charlotte or Miami. Yeah. Um, that's how we kind of look at it from like an expansion um, standpoint. If we go beyond 10 uh, units, then um, we I've been able to do something really right and my kids will be uh, good in life. <laughs> you got little baby twins. <laughs> yes, I have my son and my daughter, 21 months, and they're on this new uh, wow. fighting uh, phase. I think it's just going to happen if you're a twin, this is what I hear, but they'll be best friends for the rest of their life. I li literally found them this morning. My daughter climbed into my son's crib and they slept next to each other the whole night. So. How do you even leave the house when you see something that cute? This morning I had <laughs> to leave them because they were driving me up the walls. Right. But uh, I love, it's it's a feeling that you truly, when you walk through the door and your kids run to you, it's, it's something that you can't get anywhere else. Oh, that's such a lovely thing. And, you know, I, I know people ask uh, women chefs this all the time. How do you balance it? How do you do it? But like, you're a man in demand. You've, you're building an empire. You do a lot of travel and, uh, and festivals and all that kind of stuff. Having that home time, how do you carve that out? So I'm very thankful for my wife. Um, even though she works, she's a nurse at, uh, she works long hours. Yeah. I mean, family foundation is key. Uh, I have my mom and my dad who come in sometimes to help out. My mother-in-law comes in sometimes to help out. So family foundation is uh, really ideal. Aunt Jeannie will come for late nights if I need to spend time with my wife. So Date night? Date night, yes. I never thought I would ever plan date nights right. in my life, but you need to. Yes, yes, you do. <laughs> As a busy person. Where do you go for your date night? Uh, you know, we, we're like – it, it we – we live in Harlem, so like going below 59th Street is really hard because after that you're like... It's like um, you have to put your scuba mask on. Right, <laughs> but you're also just losing time. Right. Um, so we've found some really good places like on the Upper West Side that have been mm -hmm. uh, really good. We hang out at some local bars in our neighborhood. Um, we, we go to Melba's from time to time. It's just a, a great place with great food, and Melba treats us really well. Um, so yeah, we, al we always try to hang out in the community if it's West or East, West or Central Harlem. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's the key for being able to do what you want to do. Um, but I think as a parent, you try to find time to connect with your children and you can't connect with them on everything. Mm -hmm. And my time that I connect with my children, I cook them breakfast every morning. Oh, love so grains. Grain. Like we, this morning we had oatmeal, like freshly cut oatmeal, right? Um, where they have this, I get all, people send me rice, different rices and grains all the time. So they're always trying out. They like, they don't like it. Just throw it, <laughs> throw it out of their <laughs> no. mouth. But texture is a key, right? Because right, babies are all about texture as they grow. Um, so I connect with my kids over food in the morning time. And that's the time that we truly spend together. And that's how I get to know them and they get to know me. Um, and then at a certain time, I'm running out and my nanny's coming in because there's no other way to do it. Right, yeah. Um, no shame in that. And, uh, and, and, that's how, and that's how it works. And as they grow older, I'll find something new to connect with them. And I think a lot of parents in the culinary industry or in any industry that's busy, they get really concerned. Like, are their kids going to hate them? Are their kids, are they not going to, yeah. kids aren't going to love them? Are they going to find time to connect? And it's like, just find that little thing to connect with your kids and, you know, you have to carve out that day that is truly a family day. And you, as the employer, now if you are the employer or or the employee, you need to let your employer know like, hey, I need a day for my family because I have a family just like you do. And if you're the employer, you need to build a team around you, potentially that young chef that doesn't have a family right now um, that will put in the extra hours to make sure that you're good in life. Yeah, let's talk about the, then building that team around you because in addition to field trip, you have an incredibly popular restaurant, yes. the Henry, that has been very fondly written about and enjoyed and has really become a, a sort of staple place in New York for a lot oh, of that's people. that's great. Yeah, no, yeah, it's uh, become very consistent. Um, so yeah, that, that, that project is a partnership with another hospitality company with Cravable Hospitality Group. 
So they're the operators of the hotel. So we we partnered those, on, on that project. Those and hotel partnerships, I, 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 the more and more chefs I talk to, the more and more it seems like that is a really good business decision to go in with a hotel. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it it's a one of those things where you can literally spend your spend as much time as you can spend in it and then you can walk away and know like somebody's running this uh project that you created yeah is right it, yeah is that a different mindset than you had had at your other restaurants yeah the other restaurants you're like in it with everybody else that's some blood sweat and tears right so and you hope to get to a place how hotels run their restaurants yeah um so yeah so the hotel we we have you know, there's a partnership with Craveable. On the internal JJ team, there's a my culinary director, is Samantha Davis, who's also a partner in Field Trip. Um, I have somebody that literally follows me everywhere I go from like a day to day. Um, so she makes sure that I am tightly knitted and I make my meetings and I fulfill the visions that are coming out of my mind. Um, and then I also have a general manager of the JJ brand. So... If there's partnership deals, if there's on strategic measures, how are we going to move forward? She then um, is making sure that JJ becomes to this full potential of where he should go. And that was a decision that I made at the end of the year of I wanted to have a team that was more in-house, um, people that were constantly thinking about JJ. I just moved to in-house um, communications. So... Um, and I know I, I mentioned that I have a lot of women around me, mm -hmm. but um, I tend to that when I'm interviewing people for positions, that the women are the best ones that are qualified for the job. And sometimes most of the people that are on my team I've met along the way. Mm -hmm. It's not like I fully interviewed them. It was like... So just like you, come with me now. Right. Like <laughs> the woman Mimi is... The, my general manager of the JJ brand, I met her at a women's conference that I was doing a cooking class for BT. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, you could cook really well. She's like, yeah, I cook at home. I'm from Detroit, blah, blah, blah. We had a good conversation. Mm -hmm. She worked at somewhere really f fancy. Um, and But in her career, she was like the day-to-day -day for Dr. Dre. And like I learned about her and I was like, hey, I'm looking for somebody to take over the to manage the JJ brand. She was like, I don't do food. I was like, I think you can do it. And we worked <laughs> on this trial and and now we're at a good place. And um, it makes me feel good and relief, relieved that I have somebody that when people are talking to somebody on the phone or meeting them in person, they're representing me really well. How did you learn how to do this? Because I'm thinking like, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, 20 something year old uh, JJ who I, who I met that night who, you know, cooking your ass off, doing all this stuff, like clearly something going on, to having a team to support you as a, a brand. What is that emotional shift? How do you learn the business of that? So when you're, when you, when you're young, you listen um, to your peers that you envision to be, mm -hmm. and sometimes you will be in the same room as them cooking, and they will be talking about their career and their life, and you listen to them. Mm -hmm. So I've happened to be around Marcus Samuelsons or Jonathan Waxman's or Scott mm -hmm. Conan's um, or Wolfgang Puck, right, and listening to them or how they carry themselves, Jose Andres, like watching them at events, seeing who's around them, what does that person do, maybe slightly inquiring. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of a, a base. You know, reading. Um, my family is a my my internal family is like a truly uh, blue collar working family. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nobody that's in my family that is like a star or has an estate. I have one family member that has an estate, but Ooh, that's it. You know, fancy. but he worked he worked really yeah. hard to where he is, and he he deserves that, and his kids deserve that. So. As a kid, maybe, I'm, maybe I've envisioned to be like Michael because mm -hmm. I've seen what he was doing, but I also know how hard he worked. Right. Um, but yeah, just truly paying attention, and I, I maybe, and maybe having the community of the, being on the Forbes under thirty list and mm -hmm. being around that Forbes uh, crew helped me open up my eyes into slightly, some slightly different areas. Mm -hmm. 
on what was needed. And sometimes you have to look to say, what am I not good at and what do I need? Yeah. And I ask this because my, my brain just doesn't work in those dimensions. I do <laughs> not have an entrepreneur brain. Like I, there, I know the things I'm good at and I know the things I am not. And that kind of structural empire building kind of thing is so fascinating to me. So I'm always so interested. So to hear Brian about- Ellis, the executive chef, the executive corporate chef of the Smith. Mm-hmm. I used to work for my Jane. One day I called him and I said, Brian, I'm not liking the sous chefs I'm hiring anymore. Mm -hmm. And he said, you need to hire a sous chef that is going to do the things you can't do anymore. Mm. And you need to realize what you can do. And then you need to realize what you can't do. And that's how I came across Samantha Davis. Because Samantha's like the most organized person. She gets along with all the staff. We call her Mama Samantha. Um... And she truly believes, I think, in me sometimes more than I believe in myself. Got to have that around you. Yes, you do. And I'm able to then still train the cooks, work on flavors, and then build a business, right? And as I build a business, and Samantha then grows with the business. And that's why when we, when we got to Field Trip, I said to her, hey, you work really hard. I have to make you a partner in this business. There's no way I can just say, hey, you're going to be an employee. Yeah. Because that's just not fair. Yeah. there's. And this- she was like, nobody would ever offer me that. Oh. Ever. And I was like, well, I was in a predicament in my career where I should have became a partner of a business and I was never offered that. So if I'm going to take a, I, I look at the Chick-fil-A model very, they think they, I think they do that really well treating their employees. So that's the kind of model that I'm looking at developing as I grow. Yeah. it, And a lot of this stuff isn't taught in cooking school. You came up through the CIA. Yes. And they teach you how to brunoise. They <laughs> teach you <laughs> all of these different things. Do they give you those other fundamental skills for um, thinking, not just like a cook, but as a chef and as a business owner? Is that a thing that you you got out of your education? I mean, I did my bachelor's program there because I promised my mom I would do that. Mm-hmm. I took a year off and went back for bachelor's. I think taking the year off when I went back, I looked at the industry slightly different. But they're basic 101 and 102 classes, right? Counting, economics, Mm -hmm. uh, writing, menu writing, right? So you have a slight, a a good foundation coming out. But I tell every young kid that when you leave a college or culinary school, you should be working for the person that you want to become. Like, if you really love Sean Brock, you should figure out a way to go work for Sean Brock. So who was that person for you? I never, I never, I didn't look at it that way. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God, I just want to get a job. I, right. I was lucky enough to go work at Tribeca Grill. I was lucky enough to work at Jane. But when I applied to Jane, I didn't know what Jane was. Mm-hmm. But I went ate their food before I, I went to the restaurant because I worked for this uh, sous chef in the Poconos that said to me, anytime you go apply for a job, make sure you go eat the food yeah. to see if you'll even like the food. And I ate the food. I, said, I thought it was really great. I trailed. It was amazing. And I just happened to be very lucky in my career that I was surrounded by good people at every, at 97% of the restaurants I worked at. It's funny you say luck because, you know, there's that cliche about like, it's amazing what great opportunities, <laughs> you know, how much luck, quote unquote, luck comes to the people who are really good and hustle really hard stuff. Like, I don't see a lot of luck. I see. Well, that. I don't want. I'm saying earlier in my career. Yeah. Um, I would say now in my career, like I really grind it out and work really hard mm-hmm. and wear different hats at different moments um, and really build a network uh, to to meet new people. Also meet and also build a network for people to trust in what I'm doing, right? And also mm-hmm. to so I can entrust in what they're doing. Um, and I think that's really the key. But yeah, I didn't come up through the John George or the Danielles or the Thomas Kellers or the Nomas of the world. I felt like when I was in culinary school, I got enough of that. Yeah. And I wanted to see something different. And I just remember how Drew Nipriant treats his employees. You mm-hmm. know, I remember getting a gift for Christmas when I was there. It was like one of the best gifts I ever got as a cook in my whole life. And he gave that same gift to everybody, all 37 cooks in that kitchen. And I used to say, how does he do that? He's... And, and I asked him, 
bef- my last day, I said, hey, oh, I don't know if you know me. I'm JJ. I'm no, my, at that time, it wasn't JJ. I'm Joseph Johnson, because there was no Joseph Johnson. There was no Joe or Joey in that kitchen. And he said, oh, I see. You work really hard. You're not that good yet, but you work really hard. And I was like, oh, I appreciate that feedback. But can I ask you something? How do you afford to give everybody in your kitchen a gift for Christmas? And he was like, I want to. Tr- I want to let my employees know that I respect them, I believe in them, and I don't want them to leave me. So this is just like a little bit of something I can do. I wish I can give them more. It. It was just. It really. When you said Tribeca Grill and Lucky, I. That's why I started to laugh because I know Drew pretty well, <laughs> and I have friends who own a restaurant with him and stuff. He doesn't uh, give stuff out just because. He means it. Like yeah. he doesn't hire people just because. Like oh, I want to give that kid a break or whatever. It's because he saw something in mm-hmm. you and knew that you could could do it. Like he is one of the smartest business operators at restaurateurs. It's, it's, it's why he's had this incredible career for such a long time. And what's his number one thing, right? Rent, 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 rent. Rent is a key. The price mm-hmm. of rent is a key. So I took that little bit of knowledge mm-hmm. when I did field trip in Harlem and made yeah. sure my rent was at a point that yeah. we can afford to <laughs> sling out uh, rice bowls. <laughs> It's it's been really fun to see how many times Drew's name has popped up on this podcast. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, because there are just there's so many people. I feel like he never gets quite enough credit for all the things he has fomented. I wanted to sort of do the family tree of everybody who has come through his through him. Woof. Intense, right? It's a lot. It's a it's, it's a lot. I mean, sometimes you forget who you were in the kitchen with. There, I mean, people mm-hmm. tell me all the time, "You don't remember me? You used to be on Garmage, and I used to work saute." And I'm like. I don't remember you, but then you start talking about all the other people around. Like, oh, yeah, you were there. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, a lot of people have come through there, and that restaurant's still going, and it's great. There was an anniversary party a few years back. I think it was like 25th, and I was just walking around like you and you and you and you and you, and it was really amazing, but he doesn't do stuff by accident. No, he does. He's very smart. Yeah. So at the same time, while you're, you know, running the Henry and getting together field trip and all the stuff, you won a James Beard Award for... An extraordinary cookbook. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh! And he was the first uh, award of the night uh, at (laughs) the, which was a really great way to to kick it off. Could you talk a little bit about the process of translating this community that you love so dearly and where you've made a home, putting that into a book? Talk. That's got to be a lot of emotional responsibility and weight to do that. Yeah. So you know, Alexander at the time was writing a cookbook. Um, was writing his own cookbook. Mm-hmm. And I have always envisioned that the Cecil, when I was there, should get the credit that Aqua V, when Marcus wrote the mm-hmm. book, when Thomas wrote French Laundry, right? These iconic cookbooks that young culinary kids read or the food community reads. And I said, the Cecil is having this impact and we should create a Cecil cookbook. Alexander goes back to his book agent and winds up getting a cookbook deal and saying, yeah, okay, figure out, let's figure it out, JJ, and do it. Um, and we put together an extraordinary team and Veronica Chambers Veronica is incredible. Chambers is by far, <laughs> she's amazing. You said it. Um, and I got to work very closely with Veronica on the project. Um, and the goal was to make this, to take a, to take a community of people. So when, when you think of Harlem, you think black excellence, but then to take Harlem and show the history of like, okay, how did people get to Harlem? Okay, they came through the, the Great Migration. But what happened before the Great Migration? There was slaves. And where were the slaves from? They were from West Africa. And then where do they go, right? Because most of the time when you think about African-American food, you think soul food, right? And we, we wanted, or I wanted to make sure that this conversation became bigger than mm-hmm. that and showing everybody that it was a true American cookbook. So 100 recipes, um, personal small memoirs and essays in the book, uh, talking about hubs of Harlem, like Bengali Harlem for me is like one of the most fascinating chapters in the book. It talks about this time of Harlem when, you know, Bengali and the people that made up what is considered Bengali Harlem. Um, And the process was long, you know, we... We we hired a, a great photographer, Bia, Bia Scotto. So it was like, who can shoot the food mm-hmm. so people can really realize what this looks like? The book designer was from Latin America. Um, my food stylist was a black man. So it was like, wanted to make sure we had cultural people around the book that could deliver every step. Um, Mary Frances 
tested oh, every recipe. Mary Frances, heck yes. of food and wine. <laughs> yeah, she tested every recipe. I didn't recipe. realize that she, uh, you, you shouted her out and I didn't realize that, that she had done that. It's mm-hmm. amazing. So, um, every, but everybody kind of bought into this book mm-hmm. and on an emotional, like the emotional level to bring all these people together, but then for the James Beard Foundation, but also the committee and the judges to understand that this book represents American cooking is I think the is for me is the real conversation because you have these moments where you talk about American cooking and you're like, well, where does American cooking really come from? Mm-hmm. And you know, African slaves built American cooking or built agriculture. And a lot of the a lot of the food that we see from that time has spread all around the world. And that's kind of just what that book is showing. Yeah, the ingredients, the labor, the techniques, Mm -hmm. and all of that, um, you give it proper attribution in there. And that is a a story. I I feel like one of the great emotional beats of Friday is that that one in the American cooking category in particular, that that is a thing that it was necessary and it was needed and it was overdue. And before this, we were talking about a very, very overdue moment that happened that night as well, that Jessica Harris, right, the incredible Dr. Jessica Harris, uh, who is a food scholar and writer, and I just think of her as empress of, of, of all, was inducted into the Cookbook Hall of Fame. And she got up on stage to give her, her talk and she said something that like broke my heart into a million pieces and made me angry at uh, a whole lot of things that she was saying it was the f- her first time up on that stage. And I had not realized that and the tremendous injustice of, of that because she has written God knows how many cookbooks delivered, God knows how many papers. People lean into her history and the work that she has put into being a documentarian of foodways and especially African American foodways and the fact that it it that she hadn't been up there on that stage before I felt like it rippled some through the room and it was an important moment. No, yeah, I mean I I mentioned it on my Instagram page and tweeted about it on Twitter and um it 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 it, sh- it truly shows you like there's tons of work to be done and hopefully a moment like where you see Jessica Harris, the brilliant Dr. Jessica Harris on stage. And if you're in that room and you had the, have the power to vote or put people mm-hmm. on in categories that you think back and say, hold on, mm-hmm. I messed up here. Yeah. And I think sometimes people are like, well, we can't rewrite history, but you can push it forward. You can, if you have the power, you can, um, you can fix it, right? And um, and when I say fix it, you can you can then make sure that when the next wave comes up, that you are truly looking at everybody, right? And I think that's what for me, uh, I like to, you know, Dr. Jessica Harris is really saying is like everybody should get a fair shot. Mm-hmm. Everybody should be looked upon. It shouldn't just be because of the color of our skin or if we're a man or if we're women. At some point, these type of people are going to write the best stuff and this person is going to cook the best food. And are we giving everybody a fair shot? And I'm and I tend to see this happening as there's a shift of who we write about or what we want to give an award to that we forget about another class or another gender or a way a person looks and when people have the power, I think they should just say, I want to write about the best person that's doing something. I don't care if they're a white man, a black man, an Asian man or a woman, or they're part of a certain group or a certain religion. Like let's just write about them because they are crushing it. Yeah. Or they have wrote something really amazing. Let's figure out how to get people to know about this. Yeah. Um, So I I really want to see, I know Dr. Jessica Harris is working on another book, and I, 
I'm not sure it will be about food because this last book she wrote wasn't about food and it, it got she's, a lot of praise. She's a polymath. She, like, yeah, she's truly really. a, a genius. And um, I, I always love uh, snickering with her. <laughs> it is. it is. Uh, she gets a kick out of things. But uh, I, I mean, I, I hope, you know, I, I hope that she is. So she has a big project coming up that you are also part of at MOFAD. Yes. Which is she, and I believe she is curating all the content for, for it's, I, I believe, a year-long celebration exhibition delve into uh, black cooking in America. And I, there's a there is a gala coming up that's sort of money-raising for it too, but I was looking at the, the assembled list of people she has as part of the conversation. And it's, it's I love seeing her, you know, her, that she's the one behind this too. But I think that this is going to be an exhibit that is going to be one of those things that people remember for a long time. Yeah, and the great thing is that the exhibit's going to be in the um, Africa Museum on 110th and 5th Avenue that hasn't opened yet. So that's how they're going to kick open the Oh, I didn't realize the, that. The museum there yeah. through the exhibit. Um, it's a long time coming. So, and you know, anything Jessica does is going to, is truly thought out. Um and it has the facts behind it. So if you try <laughs> to challenge it, you must go. You trust me; it's been fact checked. You okay? You you were describing a moment that you had where you went head to head with her on something. Yeah, I went to head to head with uh, Dr. Jessica Harris with collard greens. I just kind of came back from Ghana two years later, and she was talking about how collard greens is a true green of the American South. And I kind of raised my hand. Said, "Anybody have any questions?" I said, "You say collard greens are a true green American South, but I know them to be." coming from Zimbabwe and she said no Mr. Johnson they do not come from Zimbabwe <laughs> they are something that has been cultivated really only in two places one in the American South and then from the American South to Brazil so you see Brazilian collard greens because they came from the American South so somebody took the seeds and then planted them in Brazil and those are the only two places that they grow did you feel schooled? Oh, I was definitely schooled. <laughs> the room got a lot of uh, laughter out of it. But um, those are the moments that make you yeah. better in your in your career if you really take this serious, right? Because I look at food as history, and I went back and did more research, and I can take that moment and tell somebody else, hey, I know you think collard greens come from here, but it really comes from American South. And why do you think that? Well, Dr. Jessica Harris, and she wrote about it in this book, and she then quotes a it comes from here. Like, so you can really backtrack. So she truly fact checks the stuff she says and she's not pulling it out of the air. Yeah. So you are writing a story now of your career and your trajectory and, and the beats you're taking along the way and what you've learned. And you know, it's, you're still young. You're yes, not, I am. you're I not, the, you're not the kid. I'm not the kid, but, but still you're, young. but you're still really <laughs> young and you have a long way to go. What do you want your legacy to be? Like, think of wow. if there ever is like a retirement, if chefs ever retire or whatever it happens to be, you're kicking back on... On a sailboat? Yeah, I was going to say beach, go sailboat, go whatever. <laughs> like, you're those two beautiful twins of yours are like bringing you cocktails or, <laughs> or, or something. What would be the thing that you want people to say like about you? I, I would just say being thoughtful. Everything I do is is very thoughtful. Everything is very respect. I respect everything that I'm doing from the employees to the to the cooking to the process, um, and that you know that I'm going to be true to myself. And you're going to be sitting there from all your field trip money, <laughs> from your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> Is there anything I was? I'm getting the the signs from the producer. Are there? Is there anything we didn't talk about that you no, wish that we? Had? Well, so I'm going to ask you a question that I ask everybody. This is the sort of I was thinking Oprah and the secret in, in this, <laughs> and and I think you probably have this kind of train of thought too. That I really believe if you really want something, you have to speak it out loud so people can help you get there. Yes. What is the selfish thing? That you want, the for, thing I want for JJ. I want to be the truly first chef to have a Nike, or not just Nike, but to have a sneaker deal um, where sneakers are on the shelf and they're chef shoes. Chefs can wear them in the kitchen or you can wear them in real life. 
Do you have designs for this? No, I don't have designs. I have a vision in my mind. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Dear Nike executives, <laughs> please give JJ a shoe line. Like, okay, so what, like, how many would there be? Are there, like, we'll just start women's, with one. men's? Oh, there'll be women, men's, and, ki- and kids. Okay. I love this. And and when you go to field trips, there's going to be a case where you can buy them too. No, hopefully they're like in foot lockers and then... I mean, in addition. <laughs> if you want them signed by... Yeah, we can have them on the wall like cookbooks. You pull them down, I can sign them for you. Oh, that's so funny. I always think of when I go and, you know, Danielle has like the skybox there and one of Shaq's shoes is <laughs> off in there. It's one of the biggest objects I've ever seen in my life. I never knew he had a Shaq shoe. So you're going to have to have the special edition one that you make just a pair for her. Just, just yes. It's just so funny. It's, I don't know. I just think of that every time I go up and Danielle. Same I way. want you to have a skybox <laughs> in every single outpost of your thing. We're just watching what you have created. So we have the speed round. Okay. What is your comfort food? Pizza, New York City slice. Any particular place? Mama's. Not two, but Mama's. <laughs> the original. Where is that? 106 in Amsterdam. Any toppings? I'm pepperoni guy. Okay, I like it. With the the kind they sort of like go into a cup and there's a little grease splash. No, in there. like original pepperonis that you yeah that everybody puts on a pizza, but it has to be like melted properly, and then you yeah. you get it, and then it's amazing. That's so perfect. What is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Um, Alabama. What's the name of the place? That's really bad. What's a famous place in Alabama? Oh, wait, Saws? No. Oh. They wait. won like Outstanding Restaurant and the oh, Pastry Shop. Oh, Dorsey. Highlands. Highlands, yeah. Oh. Truly, like from top to bottom. Frank Stitt and Dulcer Miles. Mm, Dulcer Miles, coconut pie or cake or whatever you want to call it. Mm. Literally made me have tears in my eyes. Yeah, there's a reason that she won a James Beard mm-hmm. Award for yes. uh Best pastry chef, like that is some incredible food there. Very incredible. What is the last meal that somebody cooked for you in their home? Wow, I don't even know this one. See, this is the thing. Nobody wants to cook for chefs. Holidays, anything. Last meal that I was cooking somebody's home that was truly spectacular. Thanksgiving, my sister-in-law made this artichoke, roasted red pepper, and like Mexican pressed cheese frittatas that were to die for. I want that right now. In 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 Bowie, Maryland. Oh my god! <laughs> and you said it right, too. <laughs> Bowie, Maryland. I always looked up Bowie. Bowie. That sounds worth traveling for. Yes. What living musician would you want to cook for, and what would you cook for them? Wow. As I know you are a music guy. I am one. That's that's really crazy. Living musician and what would I cook for them? Because I know notoriously at Chef's Club, you had a playlist that was how long? 90 hours. And Some of that music's at, uh, at the Henry. And it didn't repeat. It didn't repeat. Henry's repeats because we just try to stay away from curse words. So. Oh, makes sense. Um, I would say Jay-Z and Beyonce. Okay, so they come strolling in. Um, strolling in? They, 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 come, <laughs> they come strolling into uh, your restaurant or they just walk into your house for no apparent reason. Imagine they strolled in. <laughs> that The whole place, I think, would just the thing stop. Is they're great diners. They show up at restaurants. They do. They showed up at my friend uh, Kelly's restaurant. Wow. And Willa Jean. And she That's got five amazing. minutes notice from Solange, who was a regular. So Solange did come and eat at um, the Henry, like, super late night and chilled with her friends. Okay. Very incognito. And we are like, ooh, is Beyonce and Jay going to come next? Right. They do just show. I've had so many friends who've said, like, oh, my God, Beyonce showed up at brunch. No, it'd be, that'd be cool. I think they love food. They understand it. I think Beyonce would get the collard green salad. Okay. But what would you want to make for them? Like, I want them to – I'm a very firm believer of, like – I love everything on on my menu. Mm-hmm. Whatever talks to you, that's what I want you to get. And if you miss something, I'll send it out. Yes. They're going to get some grains. They're going to get some grains. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And dear Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's brought up Jay-Z before, but several people have said they wanted he's to a cook big, for Beyonce. He's a big, he's a big wine head. So. I had no idea. So, you know, um, you know, our wine, the wines at the Henry are very worldly and... Um, I think he would he would love uh, the Sirocco from Morocco, the Morocco that we have. <laughs> I love that. So you have, I know this probably never happens for you, but so let's fantasize if it doesn't. Okay. Five uninterrupted minutes for self care. What would I do? What would you do? Five un, five un, in only five minutes. Five minutes. You like, 
you know, you can turn your cell phone off. You can do whatever. What is what is the thing you do to take care of yourself? Five minutes. The kids are well taken care of. The kitchen's running fine. Five, five key minutes? Yeah. So this is for the up-and-coming chef who's frantic and thinking that they don't they don't have time to take care of themselves. Everybody's got five minutes. Five minutes in a line at Cat's Deli, placing my order. <gasps> What's your order? Just a rye bread, mustard, sauerkraut, and not too much pastrami. Mm-hmm. They'll laugh and say, why not? The you fatty, the extra fatty. The extra fatty. That five minute talk with the person behind the counter. It stops everything going on in the world. And you can do that at any one of your favorite favorite places that you're grabbing food to go because it doesn't matter if your cell phone is ringing, if somebody's chanting your name, you're truly in this moment where it's just you and your food or that person you're ordering the food from. Just don't lose that ticket. Don't lose the ticket or you're really going to be upset. That five <laughs> minutes will go down the drain. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks like, for having me. It's been a great talk. We went everywhere and anywhere. Crazy. And it's been a long damn time coming. Let's not make another like 10 no, years. No, never. No, not at all. I hope to see you up at Field Trip soon. I cannot wait. And hopefully we can make this episode run before it uh, before it comes Plenty out. Plenty of time. And if not, we'll t- it'll run after. And I know it will be amazing. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. And thanks today so much to our guest today, JJ Johnson. And you can find him all over the socials at Chef JJ. Chef JJ on all of these and at the Henry at the Life Hotel and soon to be at Field Trips and go and get a copy of the book. It's good for your heart, your mind, your brain, your body, your your well-being as a citizen of Earth. Thank you to our producers, Jennifer Martinick, Alicia Cabral, and Amy Frank. Thank you to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song. If you like what you heard, please tell a friend, write a review, or rate us. Those stars, those comments like, really, really help out with the algorithm, help other people find us, because we'd like to keep doing this podcast. If there is something you'd like for us to talk about or a guest you'd like to hear more from, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip. Find out more about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and Food and Wine's YouTube page. Thank you for listening and take good care of yourself. Till the next time, eat grains.